The following scene takes place on the Divinity Coast, near the banks of the Giants Basin, where, in 250 years' time, the city of Divinity's Reach will be built. When they're ready, escort all the Chosen to the caravan. Yes, sir. We leave within the hour. What was that? It came from over there. It's an ambush. Oh no! It's a shining blade! Duena, protect us. Quickly, take the Chosen into the jungle. Please don't hurt us. Keep quiet. Your suffering will be over sooner. Hello everybody and welcome to another video. So as many of you guys know, Heart of Thorns is releasing for Guild Wars 2 and Heart of Thorns is primarily going to be taking place in a region of the world we have not explored yet for Guild Wars 2, a region known as the Maguma jungle. So today what I wanted to do was take us back 250 years to the first game uh, where we could once explore the Maguma jungle. We could see a lot of areas of this region we've seen nothing of um, since Guild Wars 2's released and I thought it might be fun to do a bit of a tour for us uh, and point out some of the most exciting areas of this landscape uh, so we can kind of know what to look out for perhaps once the expansion drops. Uh, so this is the world of Tyria, um, the continent of Tyria rather, back during Guild Wars 1. The scene we just saw took place at the end of this uh, mission here called the Divinity Coast. Now where the story is currently set is the White Mantle who are in control of Kryta, this being Kryta 250 years ago, hold a grip over over the populace and once every now and then they round up villagers of a particular magical aptitude they name the chosen telling them that great fortunes are on the horizons and march them into the jungle but mysteriously as the chosen are being escorted to the jungle they're attacked as we just saw by the shining blade who take them away so during this current timeline in the maguma jungle the shining blade are assaulting the white mantle and we don't know why eventually of course it will be revealed that the white mantle are evil and were sacrificing the chosen the shining blade just trying to save their lives and this story is untold in the next upcoming missions the wilds and bloodstone fen um, but before we get to that, uh, I kind of want to show you guys an alternate entrance to the Maguma. I'm going to show off some of the landscapes. Now, this character's already explored everywhere that we have to see, so I'm actually going to swap to another character who's my Dervish, um, and we'll uh, do the long walk from Kryta and the Temple of Aegis through Majesty's Rest and to the Overlook as we now see. So uh, it's a very, very pretty region. I'm actually running with sweet effects here, which is pretty cool. I never did this back during Guild Wars 1 days. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Let's do it. Alright guys, so here we are. Uh, this is my Dervidge. You guys may remember this guy from uh, some of the old Let's Plays I did. Uh, and for the record, everything I'm pretty much going to show in this tour is covered really extensively in those old videos. Um, but yeah, we're in the Talmark Wilderness. Now I'm going to do something hopefully quite interesting for you guys here. Um, and we're going to take a look at that shaman's historical map of Tyria. Um, in which the original uh, world map is overlaid with the Guild Wars 2 world map. So we are in full screen on Google Chrome here, browsing through it, and um, our journey here is beginning here at the Temple of the Ages, as you guys should be familiar in Queensdale. And what we're going to do is we've walked through the Black Curtain, and we're now out here in the Talmark Wilderness. We're travelling through this map, and we're going to keep heading west. Obviously, in Guild Wars 2, the boundary was here at the edge of Queensdale, where we're going to continue going into another map in a second called Majesty's Rest, 
uh, past the mausoleum and finally into the Maguma jungle areas we could not travel to north of Brisbane Wildlands back during the first game. So what you'll find interesting right now is already it looks fairly jungly. Um, this is still Kryta. I uh, will speed through most of this because it's supposed to be about Kryta from the first game. Kryta was a lot more tropical in the original game um, and it became a lot more generic fantasy for Guild Wars 2. Um, but so don't confuse what we're currently seeing with Maguma Jungle. It'll be very clear once we actually get there. Uh, the main map that we're going to be traveling through that we have no real access to in Guild Wars 2, as you can see on that Shaman's map, is Majesty's Rest. And this is the boundary, the western boundary of Kryta as it meets the Maguma Jungle. Why is it called Majesty's Rest? Well, we don't know 100%. Perhaps the royalty were buried here once before, but it is the site of a great mausoleum where we know many nobles of Kryta were buried. Buried. In fact, this was the location the Scepter of All was being held, a very powerful Orion artifact that was pretty much the main focus of the first game. This is on the very edge of the jungle. I would expect if we get a map in Guild Wars 2 north of Brisbane Wildlands to travel here, um, where we could fight a very, very powerful boss. The areas we're currently traveling around in, unlike max level areas, they're not end game areas necessarily, and so most enemies we can steamroll through. However, at this mausoleum surrounded by a deep, haunted moat is um, a powerful enemy named Rot Scale. Many people actually theorized before Guild Wars 2 came out, and especially in conjunction with Tequat, that maybe Rot Scale was once a champion of Zaitan. Uh, does this mean that maybe in the expansion we'll get some more detail on what happened to Rot Scale? Yes, we could technically kill him as players here, but as to his true fate, it's a little bit unknown right now. I think it would be pretty interesting if in the expansion they covered Rot Scale, considering there's still some gaps in the story. You know, they've not been incredibly clear to us what is going on with the Risen now that Zaitan has fallen, um, and this guy, if he was a powerful general once or somehow tied to Zaitan, uh, this would be very interesting. Kryta had a very difficult history when we saw it 250 years ago. Uh, problems with undead, namely because the actions of Vizier killed Bronn back then. But uh, this is a very, very cool place and a very iconic place. You actually see my party gets wiped here. So as we travel through Majesty's Rest, we will come to the edge of the jungle. And here we will find uh, the terrain becomes very interesting. Um, see, now you might expect because it's the Maguma jungle and this is what it was called back then, it would mostly be very, very, very lush. But look at this. This is deserted. This is orange. This is barren. This is craggy. Um, the uh, Maguma jungle actually in the first game was a place of two very, very, very distinct biomes. It's kind of interesting to me then that in Guild Wars 2 they're kind of going with this biome level thing, the three layer system. In Guild Wars 1 you had the craggy, dry, higher grounds and then you also had between them the luscious forests. And they said that uh, over the 250 years between this game and uh, Guild Wars 2 most of those luscious areas actually ended up drying up too and it became known as the Maguma Waste. But with Morgamoth's awakening much growth has reappeared. So you should ask yourself when you see this footage as we travel through the Maguma jungle and we're looking Looking at the deserted areas, we should be wondering what is causing the deserts and are the plants we see here left over vegetation foliage from the previous rising of the Elder Dragons and the previous awakening of Morgamoth? Uh, many enemies will find in these craggy areas, these were typically locations where you'd find devourers, you'll see lots of pop-ups, pop-ups were a big mechanic in Guild Wars 1, not so much of a big mechanic in Guild Wars 2, they'll be burrowing out of the grounds and attacking us a lot. There's some sentient plants you'll find here uh, called Thorn Stalkers and they actually I think can exist in both of the areas but mostly you'll notice a whole bunch of big dead trees and little else in Majesty's Rest. This here is the portal to the Sagelands. Still, once again, completely inaccessible areas in Guild Wars 2. Uh, we're still north of Brisbane Wildlands, as you can see here. This is the portal. We're now moving into the Sagelands. Where I opened this video was a place called Druid's Overlook. When you completed the story missions of the first game, they would just teleport you directly to Druid's Overlook, so you wouldn't have to do this walk you guys are now watching. But for those who wanted to go on foot, those who wanted the extra titles and to clear areas, vanquish things, do things in hard mode, you'd absolutely end up exploring these locations. The Sagelands is the first big explorable area of the Maguma jungle. Unlike in Guild Wars 2 where we mostly just have big maps, Guild Wars 1 had kind of a nice mix of big maps like Queensdale, but then also smaller maps and more confined maps like Drytop. Drytop was a Guild Wars 1 map far away from where we're currently looking at, 
but uh, ultimately was one of the smaller ones. The stage lands very quickly, as you will now see, break way into these luscious, green-looking areas. Uh, and in these locations, you'll find a lot of Wind Riders. This is pretty cool, because Wind Riders have always been known through, through both Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2 to gravitate towards areas with uh, dense in magic. And uh, indeed, these waters are dense with magic. Why is this magic leaking from Mordremoth somehow? We never thought about it much in Guild Wars 1, but if were we to walk into these pools, you'll actually see a buff appears on me here, uh, saying that the magical waters of the Maguma are rejuvenating to me. And so players in these areas would get a, a couple of bips of health regeneration. Really didn't count for very much gameplay-wise. But um, was a pretty cool small thing about the jungle. You notice I'm getting hexed a lot, degened a lot. These mechanics you don't really see in the second game. But uh, overall, now we're finally getting to the more luscious areas. We're going to find more hostile plant life, like aloe seeds in these areas, instead of just the scarabs and devourers from the drier parts. So as we travel through the sage lands, uh, we can eventually come to a location called the wilds. Now, The Wilds was the first competitive mission for the Maguba Jungle. I've already set up to you guys what the story was. We're currently here on behalf of the White Mantle, and uh, players who arrived here in Druid's Overlook would then have the opportunity to complete this mission and push further in, eventually to Bloodstone Fen, which of course is uh, one of the most exciting places that I'm looking forward to traveling to in Heart of Thorns. Uh, the Wilds is kind of a long mission. I should have some footage of this rolling off in the background here. Uh, very easy to get lost in. I actually got lost very recently while re-recording this footage with you guys. But in general, it was a mission that established the fact the forest was maze-like, difficult to traverse, and um, very uh, inhospitable for the White Mountain, who essentially were us at this time. So in Guild Wars 1, um, each area location that you could like travel to, fast travel to, I'm actually had a little bit of descriptions. I'll give you guys the one for the wilds. The Maguma Jungle, it says, is perhaps the most dangerous place on the continent of Tyria. The Crichtons don't often venture inside its borders, and those who do are seldom heard from again. Stories of man-eating plants and gigantic insects are commonly told around campfires and inside the huts of local villages most of the time to scare little children from wandering into its clinging vines. So this is the idea here, and what we're actually doing is chasing the uh, Shining Blade through the wilds, um, trying to hunt down where the Chosen are. At the end of the mission, the uh, Shining Blade mess up, and they and the Chosen get captured by a bunch of spiders. A spider queen is going to eat them alive. They've all been put into cocoons, uh, and we go ahead and save them, which makes the Shining Blade think, hold on, these guys maybe don't understand the White Mantle's true plans. And uh, I guess I'll roll that cutscene cut at the end of this video for you guys. Because uh, that's when they introduce us to Bloodstone Fen. There are a few interesting things about the area. We do meet the entangling roots in this mission. These are giant trees. I'm very much hoping to see these return in Heart of Thorns. Um, that when you engaged them, would summon great cages of roots all about you. And uh, would essentially cut your frontline fighters off from your backline fighters. Now I do have footage of it, but they die very quickly because my team's quite overpowered. Um, but you'll see there that these are the entangling roots, and of course the uh, name of the ranger elite skill comes from these things. So it'll be cool if we get to see those come back in some form in the expansion. We also find some new enemies here too. These would be the centaurs of the Maguma jungle. Um, and in fact the bonus for this mission, Guild Wars 1 had a primary objective for its story missions and a secondary if you wanted to do it. Uh, the secondary objective here involves two centaurs from separate tribes attempting to form some kind of an alliance against the humans who they say are becoming a menace again. And that they're climbing through the Shiver Peaks and destroying uh, and thinning their tribes. So um, you can stop this alliance from happening by interfering with it. Basically taking out some of the uh, heads at this meeting. The last little thing is this uh, this curious object here called the people called the runic stones. Uh, that shaman actually had it on their map as well. Um, this is something that there's been a lot of wide community speculation about because it's an odd marker um, that seems to show something of a dragon or wyvern style creature there. Um, and of course, we know wyverns are going to be a thing in Heart of Thorns. So. Did ArenaNet look back to these runic stones that there has been much discussion about before and people trying to feed it into somehow the Elder Dragon story and make this work somehow? Are we going to see these runic stones again in Guild Wars 2? Uh, I would love to think that we might. So uh, that's the wilds. Once we complete the wilds, we end up at Bloodstone Fen. We head deeper on into the jungle. I uh, kind of want to round up this video though by talking about Druid's Overlook. So let's load in here. 
And of course, this is where we started. It reads here that this is located in the dry upper region of the Magoomba jungle. Druid's Overlook provides a spectacular and deceptively pleasant view of the harsh and deadly sage lands below. This area was once home to a sacred fountain dedicated to Duena, whose statue now lies in pieces in the brush. So uh, this is pretty cool. This is like one of the only statues to the gods we find in the entire jungle. There is one much deeper down where presumably we may end up fighting Morgamoth himself. Uh, the Temple of Balthazar we may have even seen in one of the trailers. Um, but here we actually find another one. This is the statue of Duena. If we interact with it, we get Duena scriptures, as you can even read in Guild Wars 2. Uh, curiously, though, if we, kneel, if we kneel here, you could actually get a quest in Guild Wars 1 by summoning the avatar of Duena, as you always could. Back during 250 years ago, the second exodus of sorts hadn't fully happened. The gods weren't fully gone, and so we could at least interact with their avatars back then. So this is the avatar of Duena. She says, uh, may the light of Duena shine upon your soul. What's on your mind? We actually get this really fascinating quest talking about some people who once lived in the jungle. Now, I should have some footage here. You guys will be seeing weird houses and constructs around the jungle, even though it's supposed to be harsh and supposedly uninhabited. Uh, and these could perhaps have once belonged to the Druids. Uh, this was the first quest we learned about the Druids. These were some people from Kryta who moved to the jungle and found some way to ascend. Uh, Duena says, Child, Duena senses within you impatience that all too often plagues the mortal mind. She now offers you an opportunity to glimpse a deeper serenity to which you may aspire. The Druids of the Magoom are holy beings who surrendered their mortal flesh to become one with the jungle will soon gather beneath a waterfall not far from here. Search through the sage lands for their meeting place and await them. Um, so you can, Duena actually guides the player character to interact with some of these druids. We do get to meet some of them some in their spirit forms um, and they chant this weird ritual. They keep chanting. They keep saying all that exists is all that must be. All that exists is all that must be. Um, and then they say we are renewed by these waters. We are unchanged by these waters. Time moves neither forward forward nor back time is the lens of perception and and lastly they say the spirit beholds the truths that the eye cannot see so it's a very cryptic thing uh when you finish the quest after you've witnessed their ritual uh they say it's not often that they allow mortals to witness their rituals but uh they see in us like the sea uh, potential and they say don't rush your understanding of these mysteries allow them to take root and mature so um yeah it's a pretty interesting quest the druids are obviously a big mystery and i very much expect some story to come from them in heart of thorns that's one of the most uh, interesting quests i would say around this area there are two more there's a quest um from this guy here trader versailles who uh tells you to head back out into the sage lands again um and he hired a man to uh help kill a monster a legendary beast in the area who would uh supposedly drop a precious jewel he called the lilac eye will we see the lilac eye again in guild wars 2 who knows the guy he actually hired to do it was a character named graham who won't be featured in this video but graham actually you can find in brisbane wildlands as a ghost in guild wars 2 uh, and then the last quest, uh, this quest over here is from Envoy Aero. Don't forget, at this point in the story, we are kind of allied with the White Mantle. Um, and there's a man named Justicar Thomas whose brother died and he wants vengeance. And he wants to storm the jungle with forces of White Mantle from Kryta. But ultimately uh, is declined this uh, request because they need to stay and defend the undead and so forth. This is like the last quest you do for the White Mantle in the first game. Um, so that's kind of the entrance to the Maguma jungle. This video has already got very long. Um, so I'll leave it there, guys. I do think it's very interesting to look at Maguma. Um, there is perhaps still some more stuff to talk about to do with the Henge of Denrathi and some other stuff lower down, perhaps. So uh, if you guys enjoyed this, let me know. We may see another jungle tour come out or we might leave it there. Um, very much interesting stuff, though, and I'd recommend you guys... Uh, check it out in these couple of months before Heart of Thorns. If you own Guild Wars 1, maybe run back in, have a look at it. And again, I do have the LPs out. You'll be able to see all of this stuff. Everything is covered there. Um, anyway, thanks very much for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed, um, and I guess I'll see you tomorrow for some more good stuff.